just like you Maker of heaven Lord of the land And Lord of the sea Holy and true Faithful and able Lord of all time And eternity Hello there friend Every word that God speaks Is alive and full of power To inform and transform To make us what he desires us to be the entrance of his word will give you light. Truth produces roots, and then the roots will produce fruits. God bless you. This message was preached by Dr. Ferdinand Mwek, coordinator of Eternity Ministries. We believe you will be edified. For the inquiries, contact Eternity Ministries, P.O. Box 2637, Bauchi, Nigeria, or telephone 0807 570 or 0802 or send us an email at E-T-E-R-N-I-T-Y-M-I-N at yahoo.com that is eternitymean at yahoo.com don't forget the bigger God gets in your eyes the tinier your mountains become our heavenly father I want to thank you because you are God and beside you there is no other you are gracious you are merciful you are our father and for this Lord we say thank you. thank you glory be to your name forever and ever in the name of Jesus Amen. Heavenly Father we are about to get into the word of liberty the word of life and we want to ask that your word will be life to us in the name of Jesus we want to ask that you will take away the veil and open our hearts and our eyes to that which will matter in the final analysis. Glory be to your name forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I, had, um, I was looking through the uh, vision and the mission of the church. And I saw something about raising people to fulfill the purpose of God. Can I request us to uh, please turn our Bibles to Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. And I will read from verse 17 to 24. Acts chapter 20 from verse 17 to 24. From my letters, he, that is Paul, sent to Ephesus and he called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility and with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but I proclaimed it to you and I taught you publicly and from house to house. Testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me, but none of these things move me. Can everyone say that with me? None of these things move me. Everyone say it one more time. None of these things move me. That's actually the title of what I want to share with you. He say, but none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself. So that I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry 
or the task which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now let's also read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. None of these things move me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 57 to verse 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 57 and 58. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, Knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. amen and Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, you know, when I ask my friend what is the theme of the program that you are looking at at this convention, he told me that your focus is this Jericho walls must fall down and I thank God for that kind of focus because Jericho is a picture of the mighty power of God that God manifested when he set his people free and he began to bring them into the promised land after they had crossed uh, the river Jordan Jericho is actually on the west bank of the river Jordan and by the time they crossed and they took Jericho, we know the rest of the story from the book of Joshua and all the victories that the Lord gave to them as they went on conquering the nations and collecting the inheritance that God had given them. But as I prayed about coming here, I just felt in my spirit that we must look beyond moving Jericho and moving Jericho walls. You see, it is important that you yourself will not be moved. You see, it's possible to move Jericho. And then you yourself, you are moved. After you have moved Jericho. I said it is possible to do what? It's possible for you to remove and uproot Jericho. Cast down the walls of Jericho. And then you yourself, you are moved away from that inheritance. Interestingly, many of those people that witnessed the collapse of Jericho, if you remember the story, they were not the ones that took off to go to the promised land in the first place. Do you remember that story? You remember that many of those that took the journey all the way from Egypt, you remember that they perished in the wilderness. It was a new generation that was led by Joshua that crossed the river Jordan and God did the mighty miracles that brought the walls of Jericho tumbling down. So it is possible to enjoy massive miracles from God. It's possible to experience great manifestations of God's power. But you yourself, if you are not immovable, the enemies that you removed in your history, they will conspire together to move you away from the promises of God. And they will work to move you away from your convictions. They will work to move you away from the purposes of God. It is possible to pull down Jericho walls while your own walls are not secure. I said it is possible to do what? to pull down Jericho walls but the wall around your own life is not secure that wall is not intact and I felt in my spirit that I should share with you a bit about living an immovable life and that text where Brother Paul was sharing uh, what he spoke to the church, the elders of the church, Ephesian church struck me very much if you look at that scripture 
Brother Paul sent from my letters and he called for the elders of the church. So you can go back with me to Acts chapter 20. Let's take a closer look at the things that we have read. Paul sent and called for the elders of the church. And when they came to him, Paul began to tell the story of his own life. And he said to those elders, look what he said to them. You know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you. You know my lifestyle. All of you in this place, since I arrived in Asia, from the very first time that I got here in Asia, you know my life. You know exactly the kind of life that I have lived. You know exactly what my focus was. You know my purpose. You know what I concentrated my life upon. You know. I am not hidden to you. You know my manner of life. You know my emphasis. You know what was important to me. You know my focus. You know my agenda. And then he said, How I served the Lord with all humility. And I served the Lord with many tears. And I served the Lord despite all the trials and all the difficulties and the persecutions that happened to me because of the plotting of the Jews. The first thing I want you to see, because you see that later at verse 24, when Brother Paul had said all the things that could happen to him, he said, none of these things move me. The immovable life begins with the manner of your life. It is the kind of life that a person is living that will determine whether you will be moved when the storms come or you will not be moved when they come. When they come. Jesus said, anybody that hears my words and puts them into practice and lives according to my word, Jesus said, I will liken such a person to a wise and prudent person. Who built his house? Where did the person build his house? On the rock. The person dug deep. And the person laid his foundation on the rock and he built his house on the rock. I can imagine that that was quite an expensive process. It didn't look as easy as the other man. You remember there was another man who also built a house and he built his house on sand. And he did not dig deep. He did not build his house on the rock. And I can imagine if you watch those two houses, they are houses. But what you don't understand is what is under each house. You see, when you see houses in Onicha here, you don't know what is under the foundation of every house. I saw in the book of Habakkuk, God was saying, woe to those that build cities with iniquity. People that build houses with blood. That's why houses don't impress me. Because when you see the house, you don't know how it was built. You don't know what is under it. You don't know the kind of money that was used to lay the foundation. You don't know where it was got. And that is why when God will begin to shake the heavens and the earth, a lot of things that look solid now, they are going to crumble. Because... There is a foundational problem. And when I say foundational problem, I don't mean foundations the way people mean it now. So, when those two houses were built, if you looked at the houses, you will not know the one that was immovable and the one that could be moved until the storms arrived. The Bible says the rain fell, the wind blew, the floods rose, and they beat against the house. They battered at the house. And the Bible says, one house stood firm, but the other house collapsed. And Jesus said, the house that collapsed was the house of the foolish man who heard the word of God, but he did not build his life on that word. I am saying to you that if you are going to live a life where none of these things move me, like Brother Paul said, it begins with that first sentence that Brother Paul said to the elders of the church in Ephesus. He said, you know my manner of life. You know me. I'm a plain book to you. You, you know my history. You know my secret. I taught you publicly. I taught you from house to house. 
I lived with you. You know I was not joking with the gospel. You know my lifestyle. I was not playing games. I was not a hypocrite. I was not acting drama. I was not pretending to be something that I was not. If I was, all of you, you would have known it. You would have seen my kind of life. I want to ask you as we sit in this retreat, what is your manner of life? How are you living your life? Are you living your life on the solid foundation of God's word? Or you are acting drama around church? I notice that too many people that go to church now, they are simply acting. People have masks on their face. Some people can shout, they can pray. But they are owing people. For the past two and a half years, you have been owing somebody. The person has now been trying to call you on the phone. You will not answer his phone call. But you collected his money. And you are speaking in tongues. And you are walking around inside church. What is your manner of life? If you are going to live the immovable life, it begins with the kind of life that you are living. And that life begins with the life of Christ himself that is manifested in your daily practical work. What does your secret life look like? If everybody was to know everything that you do, will you still be as confident as you are inside church? If everybody was to see the film of your life played out, will you still be the super prayer warrior that you are when we come for church programs? Or you will hide in one corner and be ashamed of yourself. If everybody was to know your lifestyle, will you still sing as boldly as you sing in the choir? Or would you like to skip the church service and say, I will come back next year? Because of the life that you are living. Among the young people that are seated before me today, even your parents don't know your manner of life. Your father and your mother, they don't know you. They don't know you. They don't know you. They think they know you, but they don't really know you. Some of you young people that are seated there, you have traveled very far, but your parents don't know. Your mother still thinks that you are the innocent girl that she gave birth to. She doesn't know that plenty of things have already happened in your life. What is your manner of life? Anybody that his life is not rooted on the rock, on the solid foundation of the word of God, I want you to listen. When the wind begins to blow, and we are now in that generation when the wind will blow, that wind is going to blow your house down. Your life cannot survive the satanic flood that is coming against this generation. If your life is not rooted in the word of God, if you are just playing around church and you read the Bible, and you think that the things you are reading in the Bible that maybe God is not very serious. Like this sister here, she is laughing and discussing when I'm preaching. You understand the point? Maybe she thinks it's a joking matter. They can finish what they are discussing and then switch back to listen to the sermon. That's the normal behavior of many people that are inside church. What I'm preaching to you has eternal consequences. This thing will determine eternity. Whether you are going to end up in heaven or you are going to end up in the lake of fire. It's not a joke. What is your manner of life? I know that somebody might have preached along this line, but if we do not thoroughly examine ourselves, but Paul said to the Corinthians, examine yourselves, whether you are in the faith at all, or whether you are reprobate. I want to ask you, what is your manner of life? When you close the door, what does your life look like behind the door? What do you have inside your phone that you are holding? You know you are holding your phones inside this church now. Yes, sir. But it is God that knows what is inside. Because many of us, you lock your phone with that number. Yes. But inside that phone, your life is inside that phone. Yes. Your money is inside the phone. Your secrets are inside the phone. Your sin is even inside the phone. Yes. I said your sin is inside the phone. Yes. Now maybe there are naked women inside the phone that you are holding. In our retreat. And as the retreat is going on, God is seeing it. So what is going to happen when the wind is blowing? You now understand what Jesus said. He said, the prince of this world is coming, but he has nothing inside me. Can you say that same sentence that the master made? That the devil is coming, is walking around like a roaring lion, looking for wood to devour. 
but he has nothing in your heart. He has nothing in your handset. He has nothing in your house. Because if the devil has property inside your house, he will come to collect his property and you cannot chase him away. You can't bind him if you are owing him. He said, you know my manner of life. You know the kind of person I am. You know me. I'm not hidden. I'm not secret to you. There are lots of people. I'm, I'm not joking. There are people that are inside church. Pastor doesn't know you. I went to preach in a church. And there was this sister. Oh, she was running around. She was serving and doing all kinds of things. When the word of God came, conviction came to her. She was convicted of her sins. She broke down. She began to cry out to God for mercy. And then she came for counseling. And we began to talk. When she began to tell stories about her life, I was shaking myself I was, as I was hearing her story. The quantity of abortions that she has committed. After she came to church. I'm not talking about before she was born again now. After she came into church. With some of the people that are inside church. And she's running around and serving. What is your manner of life? The immovable life. He said, none of these things move me. If we are going to come to that point, and I want to say to you something, brothers and sisters, that is the point we must come to. I know there are preachers that promise all kinds of solutions to all kinds of problems. And they say, all your problems are going to be solved. All your enemies are going to die. Every problem will disappear. All, all, you are all going to become millionaires. You are going to have a lot of money. Anybody who is opposing you, they will bury the person. You are going to float on the cloud as you are going to heaven. I want you to listen. That is a big capital lie. The Bible does not teach any such thing. The Bible says that through much tribulation, we must enter into the kingdom of God. The Bible teaches that those that we live a godly life in Christ Jesus, they must suffer persecution. The Bible is very, very clear that this road is a narrow road. And if you don't have that attitude of no matter what happens, none of these things move me. If you don't have that attitude, you are not going to finish this race. He said, you know my manner of life. You know the way I live. I was serving the Lord with all humility. There are people who are serving God with pride in their heart. They are arrogant. They are serving. That's why you can hold the church to ransom. They will tell you, come and do something. But because you are the computer expert, you are the only one that knows what you are doing. And nobody can talk to you here. You understand? This is how you look at them. You arrive anytime you like. Is that how to serve God? You should be honored to serve Him. Hallelujah. Yeah. Listen, the Bible says, I would rather be a gatekeeper. We are in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Because one day in your courts, hallelujah, is better than a thousand years elsewhere. You should be happy that we ask you to play the keyboard in this church. Who are you to touch the holy keyboard of the holy almighty God? A sinner like you, saved by the grace of God. Now you are proud. You are arrogant. Nobody can control you. You don't listen to anybody because you are doing something to the church. There are people... All they need to do is to give 100,000 naira to this church and they feel that pastor must now come to lick their shoes because they have brought money. Serving the Lord with all humility. Serving the Lord with humility of heart. If you are going to serve God in a way that God will pay attention to you, I recommend that you do it with a humble heart. The sacrifices of the, of the proud is an abomination to the Almighty God. When a proud man comes to the place to serve God, and you are not grateful for the privilege that God has given you to touch the things of God, whatever it is you are doing for God, the Bible calls it an abomination in the sight of God. Serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, with many tears. Okay, you didn't even say with tears, you said with many tears. I want you to listen to me. A dry eye is a sign of a dry heart. As far as a Christian is concerned, if your eyes are continually dry, it is a sign that your heart is also dry. That's right. If you read the Bible very carefully, the doctrine of tears is a doctrine that is missing in the present church. 
people that God used significantly, they were men and women of tears. They were people that had a tender heart. Whether it was in the place of prayer, when they start praying for those that are lost, tears were pouring from their eyes. Is it correct for you to remember somebody who is going to hell and you are praying for the person and there are no tears in your eyes? A dry-eyed church is the reason for a generation that is going to hell in a hurry. When there are no tears in your eyes, it is a bad sign. I know that today's church, they generally preach that, are you happy? Everybody, are you happy? You will not read that verse in the Bible. You will never read, are you happy, in the New Testament. You will never read that. I normally say to people, which verse are you quoting? When anybody is preaching or speaking, I say, which verse are you quoting? Because I'm checking what you are saying with the Bible. Who told you everybody must be laughing and shouting all the time for God to be moving? Who told you that? Many times when God is moving, a manifestation of the sign of the move of God is the tears that are coming from hearts that are broken. Hearts that are tender. Hearts that are soft to the word of God. Hearts that are touched by the plight of widows and touched by the, by the problems of our generation. Hearts that are touched by the fact that people are going to hell without eternal salvation. But Apostle says, serving the Lord with tears. No, no, no. Serving the Lord with many tears. Serving the Lord with many tears. If you are a preacher of the gospel and there are no tears in your eyes, your ministry cannot be deep. Your ministry cannot touch people because your own heart has not been touched. The Lord Jesus Christ himself was a man of tears. The Bible called him the man of sorrows. He was a man of tears. The Bible says when he came and he saw Jerusalem, the Bible says he began to weep. He began to weep. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets that we are sent to you. How long will I gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you will not listen to me? And now your, your city is left to you desolate. And your enemies are going to stand around you and break down your walls. And they are going to tear the pregnant women to pieces. All because you did not know the day of your visitation. You didn't know. He was weeping. The Lord Jesus Christ was weeping when he saw Jerusalem with the judgment that was going to come on Jerusalem. At the tomb of Lazarus, when the Lord Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus, oh, John chapter 11 verse 35, the shortest verse in scripture, he said, Jesus wept. When did you weep last? I'm not talking about weeping about your problems. I'm talking about weeping about the purposes of God. I'm talking about weeping over souls. I'm talking about weeping over your own lifestyle and asking God to transform you. If your eyes are dry, I suspect that your heart is also dry. Serving the Lord with all humility and with many tears and trials that came to me. Some people think that the only way to serve God is when you don't have a problem. Pastor, you should understand. You don't know my situation, Pastor. You don't know that this happened to me. But a Paul said, all the trials and tribulations and all kinds of things were happening, but I refuse to quit. I continue to serve God. Listen, if you wait to finish solving your problems, you will never obey God. That's right. I said, if you wait to finish solving your problems, what did I say here? You will never do the will of God because the devil, the devil will keep you busy. Serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me. He say, how I kept back nothing that was helpful. I love God. One of the problems that we have now Thank God for the man of God because my friend Professor Joe told me that this is a sound church where the word of God is preached. But one of the problems we have is preachers of the gospel who will not preach the whole Bible. There are, they, they have become specialists on certain topics. They say, God called me to raise millionaires. You are a liar. God never called anybody to do that. Which verse are you quoting? You are telling a lie. God called me to bring babies to, to women. So my own is baby. This is baby factory. It's a lie. You are not a church of Jesus Christ. 
if you are a minister of the true gospel, you will preach the whole counsel of God. But Paul said, if any of you should go to hell, if any of you should perish, I am not responsible because I did not withhold from you the whole counsel of God. I taught you the whole counsel of God. I showed you. That's why if you read the writings of Brother Paul, you will see that Paul was a sound and well-rounded preacher of the gospel. That's why from the writings of Brother Paul, we have the truths of holiness. We have the truth of purity of heart, repentance from dead works. We have truths about prayer. We have truths about faith. We have truths about divine provision. My God shall supply all of your needs. He said, follow peace with all men and holiness without the same preacher. And this man says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, now the gifts, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit are given for the common good. So the man taught everything. He taught marriage. He said, husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands. This is one apostle, one preacher. Look at the quantity of holistic truth that Brother Paul taught. He said, I didn't keep back anything from you. I told you the whole truth. Oh, many pastors and preachers are going to be responsible for the damnation of their people because they didn't tell them the whole truth. But Paul said, I told you, I gave you the whole, I didn't hold anything back. Some people think that if you preach the whole truth, people will run away. Who told you that? Genuine people will come. Yes. I said genuine people will come. Hallelujah. Yes. Listen, God has people that are looking for truth. Yes, sir. Let me tell you the truth. God said to me some years ago, he said, serious minded people are looking for serious minded preachers. Yes. I made up my mind, I'm going to preach the truth. I will not have cocaine pushers inside my church. If I were a pastor, I don't pastor a local assembly. But I will preach the gospel in such a way that you can't sit in that place and continue doing what you are doing. Hallelujah. It will be too hot for you. Hallelujah. I didn't keep back anything. I told you the whole truth. I told you that people that live in a certain way will not enter into the kingdom of God. I told you. Paul said, I told you, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor idolaters, nor abusers of themselves in mankind, nor thieves, nor drunkards, none of them will inherit the kingdom of God. He said, I told you that. But I also told you that no matter the discouragement, no matter the problem, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, hallelujah, let your request be made known to God with thanksgiving and the peace of God that passes all understanding. We keep your hearts and keep your minds in Christ Jesus. I told you that. I told you, I said, be encouraged. I taught you everything. I didn't hold back. Yes. May God multiply preachers of the gospel that will not hold back. They are the ones that will prepare the church for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. And when you have been taught in every department, you will be able to say, none of these things move me. Yes. You know why? Because the word of God has prepared you on every side. Yes. The word of God has made you immovable. He said, they that trust in the Lord, they shall be like Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but which is strong, and he abides forever. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord God is round about his people from this time forth, even forever. Part of the reason the people of God are not strong when the wind comes is because they were not prepared on that side. You see, when you have not been equipped, when the word of God has not transformed your life, and then the devil comes at your life from that side, he's likely to push you down. But when the truth of God has come to you on every side, you are ready for anything. And you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. Blessed be the name of Jesus Christ. I didn't keep anything back from you. I proclaimed it to you. I taught you publicly, and I taught you from house to house. We don't have the time to study all these things. Testifying to Jews and also to Greeks. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, now some preachers, 
some creatures are coming around and they are saying that there is no need to repent. Some people are preaching that now. That Jesus has forgiven all our sins. In fact, now they are saying that all our sins, past, present and future, have already been forgiven. That's what some people are preaching. Hyper grace. Hyper grace. Thank you. You know the name in your church here. That's what they are saying. It's a lie. I want you to listen. All our sins, past, present and future, have been paid for, not forgiven. Forgiveness is dependent on repentance. Yes, sir. There is Omo in the market. But does that mean that all the clothes in Onicha are automatically clean? The answer to that is no. You have to get that Omo and join it with that dress, with water. And wash it, then it will be clean. Yes, sir. Until you do that, the debt is still there. Yes, sir. I want you to listen. Repentance means that you don't continue your lifestyle. Yes. To repent means to change your mind so that you change direction. Yes, it means that you turn. And there must be fruit. John the Baptist said produce fruit that shows that you have repented. Yes, yes. Don't come here and be saying that Abraham is your father. Now Abraham will go chop. You say you have repented, but your life doesn't show that you have repented. But Paul said, I testify to you, repentance toward God and faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Now look at verse 22. And now see. He <laughs> says, see now. I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. I, I have this compulsion to go to Jerusalem. And look over at Paul said, I don't know what is waiting for me there. Or I don't know what is happening, what is going to happen there. I don't know all the details. But I know I'm supposed to go. You see, this is the life of a man that walks by conviction. This is a man that is bound in the spirit. Once he has the Holy Spirit, it's like you have used a rope to tie him. He has no other option but to go the direction that the spirit is going. I said there is no other option but to go where? Yeah. To go where the wind is going. Yeah. To go where the wind is blowing. Yeah. He said, Brother Paul, there is trouble along that road. He said, well, if there is trouble along the road where the wind is blowing, the wind will take care of me. Yeah. The river will not carry me where the river cannot sustain me. Yes. The river of the spirit. Yes. I'm flowing with that river, Brother Paul said. Amen. Do you know that other people came to Brother Paul, including prophets yes. of the category of Prophet Agabus? Yes. And they took Brother Paul's belt. He took and tied himself and said, Thus says the Lord. This is how the Jews are going to tie the owner of this belt. And they are going to hand him over to prison and persecution. And okay. Paul said, thank you very much. Can I have my belt? I'm going to Jerusalem. <laughs> Notice that that prophet Agabus didn't say, don't go. Yes. Yes. Agabus didn't say, Thus says the Holy Spirit, don't go. Yes. He said, this is what will happen to the owner of this belt. So, but Paul could have, if you were the one that you are going to make a journey, and then a prophet prophesied, cha, 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 Thus says the Lord, then then, 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 Thus says the Lord, Thus says the Lord, ah, this journey that you are going, they are going to tie you and they are going to bind you and they are going to hand you over to your enemies. Will you say travel? You are going to say, Praise the Lord. The Lord has revealed all the plans of the enemy. Now let's command fire on all those people who are planning that in there. But Paul said, None of these things move me. None of these things move me. I None of this is. I'm going to Jerusalem. That's the direction that God has pointed for my life. I'm going there. Look, the Spirit testifies. Say, in every city, when they traveled in chapter 21, verse 4, people told him, he said, there is trouble in Jerusalem. He said, I'm going. When Agabus did that, the brethren began to cry. They said, hey, brother Paul. Hey, 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 oh, brother Paul. Paul said, stop, stop, stop. Wipe your eyes. I don't want your kind of tears. You are crying for me that they are going to tie me and beat me. I am ready to go to that place and die there, there for the sake of the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You see, the kind of Christians that we read about in the New Testament, they are different from the ones that we have today. 
who are trying, they will do everything to avoid trouble. That's why you will not open your mouth to preach the gospel because you are afraid of what will happen to you. None of these things move me. The Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that there are chains and tribulations waiting for me. But none of these things move me. May God bring you to the immovable life. May God bring you to the place where nothing will move you from your convictions. Nothing will shake you from your love for Jesus that you have in your heart. Nothing will move you. Even if there is no money in your pocket, it will not move you to go and do something contrary. Amen. Some believers, all that the devil needs to do to shift their eyes away from heaven is to produce hunger in their stomach. Once their bank account drops to 17,289 and there is no hope for where money is going to come from for tomorrow and for school fees, they will be quick to sacrifice and to sign what they call government money in their office to their own pocket. Something has moved them away from their righteousness. Their lack has removed them from their righteousness. Some people, all that they need to happen that we remove them is just for a little problem to come around. And then they are shifted. Look, there are plenty of things in this generation to move us from our commitment. See, the devil is multiplying. I want you to listen, brothers and sisters. This is the last time. And the Bible says, you might as well know this, Timothy, that in the latter days, perilous times shall come. These are those latter days. The living Bible said it will be very difficult to be a Christian. Very difficult to be a Christian. To be a Christian businessman, very difficult. Because everybody is cutting corners. Everybody is telling lies. Everybody is giving bribe. And the tendency is, after some time of resisting this thing, the tendency is for you to join what they are doing. Satan has multiplied things to move believers. Move them against the will of God and against the word of God. Move us against our convictions. To make us to do things that we know are wrong. The pressures of our time. What did I call them, please, uh, everybody now? I can't hear you. What did I call them? The, pre the pressures of our time. The pressures. The difficulties. The challenges. Look at Nigeria. Look at petrol. 250, 300 naira for one liter of petrol. People losing their jobs. Dollars swinging like this up and down. Many of our people who are importing things, you know, their businesses destroyed. Now, after somebody has gone through those kind of things, the tendency is for the devil to move the person to where the faith will fail. But you will not be moved in the name of Jesus Christ. I said you will be like Mount Zion which shall not be moved. But stand strong and abide forever. Blessed be God forevermore. Now look at verse 24 as I begin to draw to a close. Please pay attention to verse 24 now. Have you seen Acts 20, verse 24? Can we all read it together? There is something important I want to show you there. Two major keys, or some major keys to this life that nothing can move. Thank you. Praise the Lord. I want to show you some very important things that have changed my life from verse 24. Everybody, can we read it together? I want to go. But none of these things move me. I want you to shout and say, but none of these things move me. Say it one more time as if you mean it. None of these things move me. But say, look, the Holy Spirit testifies that in every city, trouble is waiting ahead. Say, but none of these things move me. God is going to put fire, fresh fire inside your heart. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You will leave this convention a changed person. Amen. God is going to put iron inside your backbone. Amen. You know there are some people, they are always bending like a fish. Any problem that comes, squeezes them in their own direction. Something is going to happen to you that you are going to stand. You will not be shifted. Amen. When the temptations that normally harass you, when they return, 
they will find an immovable you. They will find an immovable you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Hallelujah. But none of these things move me. Now keep reading. Neither do I count my life. Read, read, read. I want to hear you. Neither do I count my life dear to myself. So that I may do what? I may finish my course, my race with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Hallelujah. None of these things move me. Neither do I count my life dear to myself. You see, the Bible says that when the devil is raging upon the planet earth, that the people of God overcame him. How did they overcome him? By the blood of the lamb, number two. By the word of their testimony. And number three, they did not love their lives unto the death. I want you to listen to me here. Anything that is threatening to kill you, tell him to kill you. You see, many people in the church now, the most be the prayer point in church that if I want all of you to start shouting in prayer now, let's assume that we are praying and you are not praying very well. Now I say, brethren, I perceive that the spirit of death, even before the end of this 2017, the spirit of death is still looking for who to collect. And I just perceive that that spirit is passing on Oka Road. And right now, I, if you don't lift up your voice and pray with a voice like thunder, that spirit might catch you. Somebody pray, pray, pray. All of you are going to start shouting now. Yeah, in the name of Jesus, I shall not die. But and declare the works of God. I bind you. Yaka, 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 yaka. <laughs> you that don't want to die, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Why don't you want to die? So that you will stay on earth and continue with your agenda. With this time of life you are living. What are you doing here? I hear the devil say, I will kill you. I say, devil, kill me if you can kill me. Excuse me, please. Do you think that if it is true that Satan can kill you, he will tell you? Do you believe he will tell you? He will not. He won't. He won't tell you. Just, he, he won't wake up. You will, not, you will have died long ago. You don't know what happened to me when I realized that my times are not in the hands of the devil. Glory. G- Christians that Je- the Bible says that, that Jesus Christ abolished death and he brought life and immortality to light through the preaching of the gospel. But today's Christians are afraid of dying. You are so terrified when they are saying emba, emba months, emba months. You see, these are things that people have manufactured that you cannot find in the Bible. Emba months. You know, now we have entered the emba months and you know during this ember months you know hey plenty of things are happening hey, in fact anyway in short you have to be careful these are ember months excuse me please is it easier for god to keep you in january than for him to protect you in december which kind of god is this that you are worshiping The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, when they came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will still be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Why? He said, because in the time of trouble, he will hide me. In the secret of his pavilion, he will hide me. And he will set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. And therefore will I offer in this tabernacle sacrifices of joy. Jesus Christ said, do not be afraid of those people that all they can do is to kill the body. Is that not what Jesus said? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
Is that not what Jesus said? Yes. Why are you so terrified of, of dying? As if you have no hope beyond the grave. Or you think the Bible is a joke? There is no place like heaven. As long as the Bible says that that since the children are partakers of flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise partook of the same, so that through death he might destroy the person that had, had, listen, listen, the one that had, that's past tense, the one that had the power of death, that is the devil. And then he will deliver all those who through fear of death all their lives they were held in bondage. Yes. How were they held in bondage throughout their lives? Yes. Through their fear of death. Yes. The biggest bondage in the world today is your fear of death. That's why you can't try anything. Say, what if you die? What if you die? What if it doesn't work? If you go there, what if it doesn't work? What if it die? That fear of death, I cast it out of your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes. That's why some people are not bold. Because you are terrified. You are going to die. You are going to die. And that's why all these foolish prophets that have charlatans that have people visiting them. That's why they have a ministry. But their days are numbered. Because the people of God will know what Jesus has done for them and they will and they will close shops in the name of Jesus. The devil does not have the power of death over a child of God. He said, him who had, had, that's past tense. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the one that was dead, but now I'm alive. And I have, I have, I have the keys of death and of hell. What that means is that I cannot die until Jesus opens the door of death. It's impossible. You can't kill me before my time. As long as the fear of death is present in your heart, you cannot say none of these things move me. Yes. Because when they threaten you with death, you will change. Mm. But Paul said, neither do I count my life dear to myself. If only I can finish two things. And that's what I want to talk to you before I close. But Paul said, there are two things I must do with my life. Mm-hmm. And whether I die or whether I live is, is inconsequential. You don't, you don't, don't threaten me. Don't threaten me. Say, so now you are going to die. I say, devil, don't threaten me. Don't threaten me. Get out of here. In the name of Jesus, don't threaten me. You don't threaten me. He said, there are only two things. There are two things that if you kill me, but I was able to fulfill those two things, glory to God, I finish well. Hallelujah. My life doesn't matter. Hallelujah. But there are two things I must accomplish with my life. Now look at that verse and tell me those two things. So that I might finish my course with joy. So people are going to finish their course with sadness. When they finish running and they arrive on the other side of eternity, they are going to hear the part from me you cast into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. But Apostle said, I want to finish my course with joy. Now not to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and praise and honor and majesty forever and ever. I want to finish my course with joy. What's the second thing there? And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ. To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Those are the two things. The course and the ministry. Who has NIV? Check if your Bible is NIV. Help me to read that verse 24. Yes. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race. And complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying.
the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. He said, My only aim <laughs> is two things. Read it for me, brother. He says, To finish the race. Somebody say, Finish the race. Finish the race. I can't hear some people who say, say it with me, finish the, race. finish the race. Finish the race. That's number one. And what's the second part there? Complete the task. Everybody say, Complete the task. Say, Finish the race. Complete the task. Say to your neighbor, Say, Finish the race. Complete the task. Talk to the person, Say, Finish the race. Complete the task. Race. Task. Everybody in this church, listen, listen closely to me now. Pay attention like you have never paid attention. Listen. In those two words, you have what life is all about. Brother Paul, I believe, this is Thor says Brother Ferdinand. There are some times when I want to say my opinion, I say Thor says Brother Ferdinand, so that you know that I'm not saying Thor says the Lord, when the Lord didn't say anything. This is my opinion. I believe that apart from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Brother Paul is the most influential person that ever lived on planet earth that's what i believe do you know the books that the man wrote is being read all over the world by billions of people two thousand years after the man has died that is influence the truths that he taught have changed people's lives this man lived for divine priorities the man lived for things that are important to god the man lived a life, hallelujah, a life that is still impacting people. Do, do you see it? It's, it's what he said that we are preaching inside church. But the man is gone. Yeah. That is an effective life. Yeah. So what did Brother Paul say was the most important thing to him in life? He said, anything can happen in life. You can even take my life, but there are two things I must complete in this world. The first one is, I must finish the race. What is the race? The race represents your personal journey from earth to heaven. The race represents your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Seeing then that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which God so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of Almighty God. For consider him who from sinners endured such hostility against himself, lest you be weary in your minds. The race represents your personal walk with God, your own journey from earth to heaven. But Paul said, don't you know that in a race, everybody is running, but one person gets the prize? Say, don't you know that? Say, so, so run your race in such a way that you can get the prize. Say, now, no soldier, no athlete in active service entangles himself in all kinds of matters so that he may please his commanding officer. Huh? And people undergo strict discipline huh? so that they can win their race. He said, therefore, I, I beat my body and I put my body under. Ah, hallelujah. I make it to do what it should do, not what it wants to do. Lest after I finish preaching to other people, I myself should be what? A castaway. Ah, that is the matter of the race. Some people are going to finish their race, and when they arrive at the other side, they are going to hear, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. That will not be your portion in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. But Brother Paul said, I want to finish my race with joy. I want to finish my race. When you finish your race, you know what they are going to say to you? They say, welcome. Jesus said, on that day, the Father will set the sheep on the right side. And he will say to them, come you blessed of my Father. Into, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. When you finish your race, you will hear from the master, Welcome, you blessed.
blessed of the Father, enter into the kingdom prepared for you. The glory of finishing the race is that you will step into eternity with the Almighty God forever and ever. You will inherit the kingdom. Because when you lived your life on earth, the kingdom was ruling inside you. But there is a second thing that Paul said I must complete. I must complete. What is that? He says the task. The task. I want you to listen. Every believer has a race to run and a task to complete. But friend, now what is the task? The task is the assignment that Jesus has given to you. The task is the ministry that Jesus has committed to your hands. And he's going to ask you about it on the last day. So the question is, as a person, do you know your task? Do you know your ministry? Something has happened to the church in this generation that is, is, a, is a trouble to my heart. When we got born again, I schooled at the University of Nigeria in Enugu campus, where I trained to become a medical doctor. In one of the things that they taught us immediately after we got born again is that, look, if God didn't, if God wanted, as soon as you gave your life to Jesus, he would have taken you to heaven. So the fact that he didn't take you to heaven means that he has work for you to do here on earth. He has an assignment for you. And you must pray and pray and fast and seek God and study the word of God until that assignment is clear to you. That's what they taught us. So we prayed, we prayed, we said, Father, I don't want to waste my life. Father, I don't want to waste my life. What do you want me to do here? Why did you post me to planet earth? We read about John the Baptist saying there was a man sent from God. There was a man sent, sent, sent from God with an assignment. Father, you have sent me into this world. What do you want me to do here? Review my ministry. Father, we prayed, we prayed, we prayed, we cried, we wept. And by the time I was leaving campus, it was clear to me what I am to do with my life. Do you know what you are to do with your life here? What will you tell Jesus when you stand before him and he says, have you finished the task that I gave to you? And then you will say, which task? So you didn't even know the job I gave you to do. Now listen to me before I close. There are two tasks. You have the general task which is written in the word of God for every believer. Do you understand that? When the Bible says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that is part of your task. Whatever you read in scripture as a command to a child of God is part of our task. Yes, sir. Did you understand what I said now? Yes, I said whatever you read in scripture that is a command to every believer is part of our task. It's your assignment. When he says you should forgive, that is Jesus giving you that ministry of forgiveness. When he says reconcile others to me, win the lost, that is the task. Every command of scripture is part of the task. That God has given to every believer. Amen. Now, but here is the final part. Apart from the general task, listen now, you also have the specific. Somebody says specific. Yes. You have your specific purpose, your life assignment. That's why I was happy when I saw that the church equips people to fulfill purpose. What is your specific assignment that Jesus has given to you? But friend, and why do you say that? Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. Colossians 4 17, he said, and say to Archippus, say to Archippus, make sure that you fulfill the ministry which the Lord Jesus has given to you. Now notice, the whole book of Colossians was written to the church of the Colossians. Is that not correct? But there was a specific message for Brother Archippus. Does that make sense to you now? In the same way, the whole Bible is written to every believer. But there is a specific assignment for you. There is a specific responsibility. I come and hear about Paul. He said, none of these things move me. Neither do I count my life as anything to myself. If only I can do what? Finish the race and then do what? Complete the task. When you complete the task, do you know what you are going to do here? Those servants that their master gave talents and he said, occupy until I come. When they finished their task and the master came back, what did the master say? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy, joy.
child of your master. Not enter into the kingdom. You see, because it's already inside the kingdom. But there is a second to enter. There is something else to enter. The thing to enter when you finish your task is you enter into the joy of your master. In other words, you are in heaven. But you are not just in heaven. Your master is happy with you. And you enter. You enter. In fact, huh? you enter into the joy of your master. That is eternal blessedness. Somebody give God praise inside this house. Do you understand? Give God praise. Do you hear the word of God? You enter the joy of your master. Now listen. Those are the two things I'm living for now. Those are the two things I'm living for. None of these things move me. Anything can happen to affect them in life. And plenty of things have already happened to me as you look at me. Anything can happen. You can take anything. You can do whatever you like. But I must finish the race and I must complete the task. Hallelujah. Why is that so good? Because by the grace of God and by the message of the Almighty, I want to hear, Welcome, thou blessed of my Father. Enter into the kingdom. That is for finishing the race. Number one. But number two, there is something else I want to hear. Oh, there is something else. Okay. There is something else I want to hear. It goes in my heart. I want to hear on that day. When the Lord Jesus Christ will look at me and he will say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Hallelujah. Welcome and well done. Rest and task. That is it. See, if you are living your life, I want to warn you now. You see, I may not, when, when I have only one opportunity to preach to people, I always listen to God carefully. And I'm telling you what God said I should tell you. I'm telling you what God said I should tell you. If you don't finish your race, you are of all men most miserable. If you don't discover your task and finish that task, you wasted your life. Because the question is, what did you do with your life? If you didn't use your life to fulfill the task, what did you do with your life? And it's only one life you have. You are not coming back. It's only one life you have. Let us pray. Let us pray. Those that are joking with church, they should stop. This is serious business. Let's pray. Open your mouth and begin to talk to God now. None of these things move me. Whether there is money in my pocket or there is no money in my pocket, whether there is food on the table, whether I live or die, whether you clap for me or you slap me, whether you mock or you agree with me, none of these things move me. I must finish my race. I must complete my task. It's compulsory. It is compulsory. It is mandatory. I must finish the race and I must finish the task. You need to lift up your voice and respond to God.